Mitsi Aro is one of 15 islands which make up the Cook Islands it belongs to and is situated in the southern group of islands. It is the fourth largest of the Cook Islands and is a volcanic island with a Makatea coral fringe. This means it is made up of raised coral limestone which has been pushed up by volcanic activity. Miti Aro is 6.5 kilometers long and 4.5 kilometers wide, with a total land area of 2,230 hectares and a total population of just 189. This makes Miti Aro the least densely populated island in the country, with 8 residents per square kilometer. Life on Miti Aro is typical of quiet and peaceful island life. Like the rest of the country, since the arrival of missionaries in the early 1800s, Christianity is a religion practiced by the island's inhabitants. The first missionary Reverend John Williams arrived on the island in 1823, and since the introduction of Christianity, the island now recognizes two main denominations. The Cook Islands Christian Church, or CICC, claims around two-thirds of the population as members, with the other third mainly belonging to the Roman Catholic Church. The church is an important part of island life, and every Sunday, the island's inhabitants are in full attendance. The rest of the day is a rest day, and the streets of Miti Aro become even more peaceful than usual, with people either in church or at home with their families relaxing. Fun and recreation for children and adults alike can include a trip to one of the many small isolated beaches, or sliding down the extremely slippery algae covered boat ramp. If your preference is more for fresh water, there are a number of beautiful, cool freshwater caves at different locations in the inland of the island. Here, you can leap off the rocky outcrops and splash down into beautiful crystal clear freshwater, or just float around in the coolness of those hot summer nights. Because of the isolation of the island, the cost of buying goods at the main store is higher than developed countries and even the main island of Rarotonga, due to the high cost of shipping or air freighting many of these goods. As well as this, soil is relatively unfertile in the Tiaro, and therefore there are only several pockets of land. Atai Taurangi, Auta, Mangarei, and Takaue, known as foodlands, where the island's crops are grown. This fertile soil comprises only 5% of the total soil in Te Aro, while the other 95% is made up of makatea, swamps, and lakes. The largest of these lakes, Rotonui, which translates to Big Lake, is roughly half the size of the entire island, and with the Rotoiti, or small lake, the two lakes and associated wetlands make up approximately two-thirds of the whole island. Due to the limited production of agriculture and expensive imported goods, residents rely on fish as their main source of food, 
along with the limited root crops and vegetables that are grown. A large proportion of the fish caught and eaten is the maroro or the flying fish. Maroro and tuna are the two main types of fish caught on the island. Maroro or flying fish belong to the family Exocetidae. The genus of flying fish caught in Mitiaro are known as Cypsisalaris and are one of seven genera of flying fish. There are 12 recognized species within this genus and 64 known species of flying fish in total. For most of the time, maroro are caught at night. Traditionally, this was done using a rama or flaming torch and an wata or scoop net. Take the two kiko and uh, put them together and then fold them in one piece and then start binding them uh, about or maybe 50 centimeter apart and then wind it and tighten them up uh, to the whatever you want uh, uh, for that time and then and that's it and take it with you and two or four onto the yeah onto the boat uh, when that when you start uh, uh, <clears throat> at night when you start at uh, scooping the uh, I think that's when you start uh, lighting the, uh, the torch. The maroro spawning season takes place in the waters around Mitiaro from July until December each year. Well, uh, over here, uh, when we start in June, in July, they start from that side where the airport is. It all goes around the island from July to December. And uh, the following year, and also started again from that side. I don't know why, but it's always happened from that side. It goes around the island. It doesn't mean the, the mother can only come on this side. It's always happened all around the island and corresponding with a particular three-day period of the moon phase. This spawning is known as the Maroro 2. Well, they go by moon, really. It's the, mainly the Maroro 2, like it likes spawning. When the Maroro is spawning, they follow is the quarter of the month, the new moon and the quarter moon. But usually on the quarter of the moon, that's when they, they know uh, where yeah, they know that's where the fish starting to born. It's a spawning. That's when they start going out. Two days, two days after the uh, quarter of the moon. And this time, the maroro come together in large schools in order to carry out the spawning and swim closer to the shore. This makes it much easier for the local fishermen to catch them. Some people believe that only maroro that are able to release their eggs will survive. The unfortunate fish that are unable to will sink to the bottom of the ocean to die. Traditionally, and to this day, fishermen are able to tell that the maroro too has begun through observing several indicators. 
the weather becomes overcast or rainy, the seas become rougher, and often large number of seabirds will flock together. When these signs are observed, the fishermen will paddle out to sea to search for marauder aggregations. Yeah, that's another sign too. Uh, when we see the birds, we know there's the. It's, it's only happened, but when we comes to the nights for the marauder, and uh, when we out there, the fishermen's out there. So when we see the birds, that we know there's the marauder there. That's another sign that telling us where the maro is. Typical maro fishing in the Cook Islands is conducted at night using lights. But for maro too, fishers are able to catch the fish during the daytime because of the large accessible numbers of fish. This is done with the uata, a special scoop net which is attached to a long wooden handle approximately two or more meters in length. The net, we got about two meters long the handle and uh, we got the face in front of the handle. We just put it down till we reach the, uh, the model. What we do is we just watch the face of the model going. We put the net in front of the face of the model. What they do is just they go into the net and we just pull the net up and then pour into the canoe. Straight down, we have to go down and then just pull it up straight and pour it into the canoe. There are several traditional rules that are observed during the model or two. For instance, throughout the season, Curfews are imposed upon the pastors and their wives by the chiefs, or uyariki. A rule for our traditional, from our fathers, and the pastor must have to stay inside the commission now. Uh, has to be patiently, uh, without uh, doing any works, any activities, and coming out of the, the field, the commission house. And now I learned that it is true because uh, uh, when they come out and abuse those uh, rules and uh, when we go out on the sea, we're going to get a bad luck. So like the flying fish uh, just uh, spread away, scattered away. And yeah, and uh, so it's a fisherman not happy at all because of uh, tiring of paddling and from other side of the island and the other end and uh, yeah so I agree that the pastor must have to stay inside the mission house oh yes that's true <clears throat> since I've been here uh, for three years uh, this is the rule the, the people on the island so they asked me if I can uh, still continue to stay in, in the compound for three days. So in the way of helping them, I see their point because uh, <clears throat> to keep me in the compound is to, uh, to ask for more uh, a blessing is on the fishermen while they go out and do the fishing and bring the the uh, flying fish in uh, during the, the spawning time. So at that time, I have to stay for three days uh, to pray, you know, to to keep the fish, fish coming. This is the uh, tradition from the old days until now. The first catch of the day is distributed to pastors, children, women, chiefs, elders, widows and visitors. It is only the second catch from the return trip that will be for the fisherman's family. 
maroro caught traditionally during the maroro too are not to be sold. They are to be shared and distributed and given for gifts for friends and families on Miti Aro and the other islands. One of the main traditions uh, for the Maroro is they do not allow the Maroro to be sold uh, on the market or wherever. And as far as they're concerned, Maroro is uh, a given uh, fish for the other and uh, it shouldn't be sold. And that's how they they believe in uh, and if they do in my view if they do start selling their model they will change the whole picture of that uh, model on the uh, I'm sure that fishermen would not allow the mamas to go and do their bags out of their canoe and uh, they probably want all their cash take on and for themselves. So I think that's one reason why they don't want to, uh, their maro to be so anyone to sell their cash. Maroro 2 and the aggregation of flying fish was not always unique to Mitiaro. In years gone by, the spawning was a yearly event in the Ngapu Toru group of islands. This includes Mitiaro as well as its neighbouring islands of Mauke and Achu. However, in recent years, the people of Mauke and Achu have lost the traditional knowledge of the ways to read the signs of the Maruru tomb. Yes, it's true. I don't have any more. Well, <clears throat> nowadays we are using uh, the other ways of, or other means of getting out of the ocean. And uh, we are not using these two are not using any more of the traditional canoes with paddles to go in the sea. So they use this new technology nowadays with a machine on the boat and go out. That's, I think, cause the fish stock in these two islands to disappear. <clears throat> so it's only the island, uh, Michiaro, is using always of the old ways of fishing here in Michiaro without using any machines or any any uh, ways of getting out but by using a traditional way with a canoe and a paddle to go out and get their fish. I think that's a problem with these two islands and other islands in the Cook Island. Like Rarotonga, the main island Nowadays you see boats, fishing boats going out, but no more of these canoes and uh, paddles just to go out and get fish. I think nowadays people are getting greedy to get more fish on the table and the thing to get more money to feed the family. Here in the island, I don't see these things happening here in Michao. They're using their tradition ways and they keep it as it is without any interfere of the outside coming in. Maoke and Atu no longer fish the spawning aggregation and the Marorotu fishery is now only observed in Mitiaro. The importance of recording the Marorotu in Mitiaro is therefore high in case the practice also stops here. This will leave a legacy behind for future generations so that they can learn that this event once occurred, as well as possibly assist in reviving the practice in Mauke and Achu. There are times when uh, the fishermen would go out and catch the maru and uh, it just, uh, they just so much maro that maro is still out there spawning and the, the man is too tired to go back and catch. Then uh, the younger boys would take their turn just to go and uh, 
probably practice catching them. Uh, but there are times when just so much marrow, they catch so much marrow. And uh, uh, I think lucky nowadays that they have freezers. They uh, store them in their freezers, and then as soon as a flight goes to Rarotonga, it is shipped out. But they still have so much marrow. Like, for example, when the, our sports team went to Moke, we filled about five plastic bags, Eraro plastic bags, I will not say Eraro, <laughs> but those big plastic bags filled them with marrow and they took it to Moke. The marrow are usually caught on the leeward or west and northern sides of the island. However, weather circumstances and the seas and currents can affect where the fishermen will go to catch the fish, and if the weather is too rough on one side, and fish are spotted on the other side, then the fishermen can transport their canoes by truck or trailer to fish on that side of the island. Currents and tides therefore play an important role in marauder fisheries, and this is why traditional rules such as the pastors and wives curfew are adhered to so strictly. Another rule observed during the Maroro too is in regards to the women. Women are not allowed down to the wharf at all when the boats are out fishing. There is uh, like a taboo on the island when the papa go out fishing with the Maroro and the mama have to stay away from the beach. You no, know, right down the beach they have to come a bit further or just a distance from the uh, the Sunday school, you know the Sunday school, and sit there and wait. They have to wait until the, the papa come back, you know, where there are loads of uh, marutu. That's when the mama goes down. Some of the mama, they uh, sun dry. That's the, um, the, the woman's job. Uh, just the father, the men, or, you know, a family, they have to, just to help, but mainly the work is by the mamas, you know, sewing the maro and hang it. And also, well, on our island, we say the woman is the backbone of our papas. Because they do most of the work, mainly for the fishing. When my papa comes home, they do all the cooking, the omu and all that. And that's most of the work, even community work, that's the mama's job. However, there has been doubt cast upon whether this is a traditional rule or one that has been made up by the male fishermen in recent times. Yes, before, uh, during, I well, say about the, in the 80s, I was here. And as mama, we go right down the beach and sit there. And just recently, about a year ago, and the fishermen, they had a meeting to stop the mama going down. I don't know why, but maybe because when the fisherman comes from the shore, the mama just rush to the canoe and get all the fish. Not all, like they pick six, five in each canoe, and then the fisherman got nothing not much left to take it home. And the other thing is like one family, they got plenty of children at home. The children goes to and pick the maro. And like I said, some of the family got a lot of maro at home, but the fishermen that went out had leak it in to take it home. However, this does highlight that during the Maroro 2, 
men and women have different roles, which have been assigned in order to do their part during the season. For instance, it is only the men who fish for the maroro. Men, women and children unload fish from the canoes. Men take care of the maintenance of the canoes and women are in charge of scaling and cleaning the fish, as well as preparing and cooking the maroro for meals. Women in Mitea Aroe also traditionally in charge of making salted fish. Although this does not happen very often anymore, and fish is more often eaten fresh or frozen for later use. What we do here on Mitiaro, the mama is uh, with the friend uh, Maruru. So usually they have to scale uh, the unai, and then cut the head and the tail, and then split it in half. And when you open the maroro and there's uh, like a liver or down at the bone, they uh, they take it out from the tail, pull it, and then clean it inside. It's all white, no blood or nothing. And then they get the... They had a special... Sometimes they use the, the coconut uh, prawns, the anu. They make it and then thread it through. The mama, I've seen one mama from Rakahanga, they had a, bar uh, a barrel and the salt in. They put the maro in when they were doing the end taro, put the maro in for a while and then take it out and, and prepare and put some more dry salt on and hang it. This is a representative of how gender roles are assigned on the island and in the Cook Islands generally. Often, the Outer Islands or Pa Inua observe traditional gender roles more strictly than Rarotonga does, and Miti Aro is no different. While men are in charge of outside labour, women are tasked with roles such as cleaning, cooking and child rearing. This is a structure that has remained in the island and in large parts of Polynesia, since the arrival of missionaries and the introduction of Christianity. However, this does not always mean that only men are to carry out the job of bringing home the bacon. Both women and men hold government positions in Mitiaro, and government jobs are in fact one of the main sources of employment, with over one third of the residents relying on government jobs. This equates to 65 residents of the 189. Most of the active fishermen also hold down government jobs. Yes, uh, workers for government uh, uh, is an added uh, earner for, for really the main earner for the people on the island. Uh, without that, uh, it's very little. Uh, money that comes on the island. A group of women called the Wainetini have also been formed to carry out livelihood activities which keep them busy. Okay, they, uh, with my role in the Wainetini, my job is I'm looking for money, project. I, I made uh, one, two, two big projects for the mamas, but it's not for the, for the maro, it's for the maire and also for the, uh, you know, for making coconut oil for the mamas. And, and we have a committee. We have the committee, uh, five ladies in, to, to be working for the project, the maroro and the coconut oil. Maroro fisheries is not unique to the Cook Islands. Other Pacific countries such as Kiribati, Fiji, Papua New Guinea have developed flying fish fisheries and in Asia, Japan has done extensive research into this type of fishing 
as the spawning of flying fish also occurs off the shores of Japan. Through research such as this and observation, it is known that during the Maroro II, flying fish generally deposit their eggs on algae and debris or other substrate. This is observed in Mitiaro as well as Japan. The Subcellarus species spawns in association with sandy bottoms. During the release of the Maroro eggs, the water turns murky or cloudy, white and milky. That area the fish spawn, yeah, the Maroro spawn, you know, all that area, the, the water is all milky by the, uh, the eggs, uh, when they lay the eggs. Yeah, not, not only that area, even when we scoop the maroro and uh, to bring it ashore, we, we, because there's still eggs in, in the maroro, you know, where the area in the passage, in the harbour, we, we landed. So even that area is full of the eggs uh, of the maroro. The spawning is prime time for fishermen to catch the fish. The spawning itself only takes a few seconds, after which the fish return to deeper water. The Mitiaro Maroro 2 fishery is one that is very successful due to the large quantities that are caught with no outlay required for fuel. Though the fish cannot be sold, they provide a real bonus to the livelihoods of Mitiaro and those in the other islands that benefit from the free distribution of the fish. However, there are dangers involved with this fishing. The weather and seas can be unpredictable, and as with any fishing, the weather forecast should be observed before heading out due to risks of being overturned or carried out to sea in strong winds. For the most part, the fishermen are experienced enough to know not to go out when the seas are looking rough or the weather seems ominous, so these sorts of risks are usually avoided. Safety is increased because the fishery is a joint activity with a number of boats all fishing side by side. You don't really know the, the water, the, the sea over here. Well, it's better for you to learn from a local. That's the only way you're going to get safe than uh, Get your model. And uh, I think it was my fault that I, when I went out, I went out too far. Plus, it was uh, really windy. I didn't realize that I was too way out, that, that I was the wind was just taking me out. It was too late then, too late for me to come back again. The, was, the wind was too strong. The fishing of Maroro also faces difficulties due to the sharks, which swim up and eat the Maroro, sometimes right through the nets being used to catch the fish. Luckily, the sharks have yet to cause any harm to the fishermen. Up until now, there have been no shark-related injuries or deaths. The sharks, they all over the place. They come in, uh, when it's good, the, the Maroro, they come and attack. The one in the net, they don't go and chase the maroro. They come and attack the one in the net. When you pull the net, it just come right up close to where you're sitting in. This where the sharks yeah, And they bigger than those coming. Yeah. The difficulties of maroro fisheries are therefore far outweighed by the successes, particularly during the spawning season.
While there are threats with regard to the future of tuna fishing due to the large amount of industrial fishing done by foreign fishing vessels in the Pacific Ocean, the flying fish fishery has no threats. At the moment, foreign fishing fleets are not interested in Cook Island's flying fish. The Cook Island Prime Minister has also committed to areas around each island to be closed to foreign fishing vessels. We need the, our fish stock uh, to, 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 to put on the table for us around this uh, area in the islands, of course around the Pacific too. Uh, I agree with the with the marine park. There's another way to to keep our our fish around in the ocean around the Pacific. So we can we don't have to to look elsewhere. Another real concern that exists on the island is the declining and aging population, which occurs due to a problematic labor drain seen across the country in its entirety. One would hope that this problem will be addressed, perhaps through encouraging low-impact ecotourism in the outer islands. This could encourage the Cook Islands able-bodied people to stay in country to work, Other than this, there does not seem to be many big changes on the horizon for Miti Aro, and hopefully, the island lifestyle and contentment will continue long into the foreseeable future. The catch of maroro and other species of fish done by local fishermen is on a needs-only basis, and like all traditional local fishing, is very sustainable. The flying fish fishery has so far not attracted the attention of foreign fishing vessels. Unless this changes, or other impacts such as climate change alter the ecological balance, then this traditional fishery should remain viable long into the future. I think there's a good reason we want to teach to our great great grandchildren of the rest for themselves after us because this will create this uh, what we are learning from our fathers to learn to our children to learn this opportunity given to them by us and for them after us I think so they're gonna keep it like what we are doing because from our father from our great grandfathers to the, our fathers and to us now. Maybe we can continue to, to tell to our young ones about the methods or the tradition of the, keep, keeping the rules for fishing the flying fish. Yeah.